Have you ever wondered how buildings are able to withstand earthquake events? They can be quite devastating and you see a lot of destruction. So what are the basic principles behind seismic design? And I'll detail it down in some simple calculations that help you understand this potential complex phenomenon. My name's Brennan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. Well, first up, what is an earthquake? Everyone can understand it, but it's basically where the ground underneath the building shakes it, cause earthquake force into the building. So it's more about the translation and movement of those forces, but how much force is induced into your structure. So it's like an acceleration and deceleration and how stiff your structure is was how quickly it will transmit those forces. The stiffer your structure is, the higher the forces. The softer your structure is, the lower the forces. But it's actually a little bit more complex than that because you may think that, oh, I want to lower the forces so I can make my structure more soft. It also means it moves and deflects more. When it moves and deflects more, potentially there's other actions such as structures inside the building that will cause damage. Non-structural elements, windows, light gauge walls that aren't participating in the seismic resistance that will get damaged if your structure is too soft. So it's a little bit more complex than just making sure that your structure is softer. And what type of systems can help resist those loads? We have many different types. You have shear walls, brace frames, sway frames. So a brace frame is essentially like a cross brace here. This could either be a shear wall or a brace frame where it's resisted in the direct action, either in tension or compression of the elements. Or a sway frame, such as on the bottom here, see here, is through a moment connection, so the columns need to bend over. Now, most of the time, you do want to probably transfer more in this brace frame situation as it's more controlled than your sway frame, but in some situations, you don't have another choice. But where do you start? In any seismic design, or building design, or real estate, it's all about location. Location, location, location will fundamentally define what loads you need to design for. The higher your R to fault lines, the higher the risk, the higher the earthquake that you need to design for. So you need to watch out for where you're designing that structure to work out what loads and what type of designs you need to consider. If you're going down to even the soil, the soil can have a major effect. It can either amplify or dampen out the forces. Or even sometimes you can even have events where the ground turns to liquid. What is that known as? That is known as liquefaction. So when the ground shakes, it liquefies. It means that your foundation system needs to be able to cope for that liquefaction. Otherwise, your buildings will sink into the ground. Literally, the ground will rise up as the building sinks. So you do need to be careful about where you are and the type of events that you need to design for. And the risk hazards of that specific location will define on what design characteristics you need to consider. Seismic design fundamentally boils down to two core principles. That is about controlling where your damage is and how it is damaged. So the core principles is hierarchy of strength and ductility. So what is hierarchy of strength is where you consider where you want your structure to fail. So typically you don't want to fail in the floors as that would be potentially catastrophic. Sometimes you might want to create specific joints that fail before something else so you can have a more controlled event. So it's about looking at where you can fail and where you want the structure to fail so you can control that failure into a specific point. It does mean sometimes you need to over-design something. For example, you never want your foundations to fail. If the foundations fail, literally the building will come down. As it's the last point of call of where you're transferring the forces into the ground. So it means that your foundations will have a higher factor of safety than something above it. So it's looking at where your points are and which points you over-design and which points you may allow a little bit more ductility in them so they may have a closer point of failure so they can yield and displace provided that you can control them. Ductility, on the other hand, is about having the building help dissipate those forces. So ductility is about the damage that the building will see. The more ductile your structure are, typically the more cracks you will get during a seismic event. But provided you've designed it in the correct way, it means that you can have a controlled failure. Ductility is about trying to change your forces from a shear to a flexure that can be more controlled. The more ductile your structure is, the more damage it will see, the more dissipation force it will have, but the more likely it's able to survive because you've detailed it up in the correct way. Having a highly ductile structure does mean that you need to carefully design and detail each one of those joints to allow it to achieve the forces that it's trying to see. Now, you may think about this being a really complex design consideration, thinking about time history, the building shaking, decelerations. 
Well, in the end, it's really not that complex. We've had some really smart people be able to break it down such that anyone can look and design for it. And it's all about how much the building moves and displaces and about the base shear and how much percentage of base shear pushes that building over as it is a deceleration. So I've got a simple calculation that we'll run through. So we'll look from top to bottom and as we're running through the different floors, you can see there is different point loads on each one of those floors. They apply a force to the structure and of course the shear force will increase as you go down the structure and how much base force that you have is done through those simple calculations of looking at the percentage of base shear. Then all you need to do is look at is the modal frequency of your building and where each one of those forces will apply to the structure. So you have a series of point loads and it just comes down to a simple fixed base and cantilever off the structure. Now we're not going to look at the behavior interaction of the soil, we'll assume that's taken care of. But the structure itself is a simple cantilever with a series of point loads on it that apply the forces to the overall seismic system. So each of those little sticks and stiffnesses below is the whole seismic system for each floor. So this allows us to do a quick back of the hand calculation. Doesn't matter whether you're doing it in the US, Australia, New Zealand, or even Eurocode. Knowing what your typical base shears are, you can back calculate to see where your building sits. When you've done the back calculation, even if you're using a complex software such as eTabs or SkySiv, you can make sure that those base shears are in the correct order of magnitude. Specific locations will typically see percentages of base shear based on their ductility. So by looking at the base shears and the calculations, you can roughly predict what your moments are before you've even jumped into that more complex software. We're even validating that complex software through looking at those base shears that are applied to it. It is all about acceleration and deceleration. There's some advanced techniques that you can use in seismic design that you see in a lot of those fancy structures, like Type A 101. It's all about dissipation of forces. There's a number of ways that you can do this. You can either have tune mass dampness in your structure that counterbalance as the forces apply to it. You can either have viscous dampness that come in that push and pull. So it helps slow down those forces and dissipates those loads. You can have fuses that will deform and pull. As you're dissipating the forces, the mechanical action of yielding a structure will help dissipate the loads. Now you can just easily cut out that fuse and replace it. But with anything, it's all about controlling the mechanism and how the building behaves. So why you think about, I just might throw in more walls, you do need to be careful about a couple of things. Seismic walls and or shear walls are really great for bracing up that structure. But you can't just place them on one side or in one direction. If you do, you will get a torsion event. Torsion events typically twist and distort and you have a lot bigger forces. So looking at how the building behaves when it's pushed and pulled to make sure it's behaving in a somewhat directional manner. You don't have any of those torsional actions that can potentially either increase requiring bigger designs or be catastrophic if not effectively delivered. Another aspect as well is a sudden change in stiffness. This is typically known as a soft story. So we're talking about rigidity, the floors above can be very rigid so they can move in a quick way. But if one floor is specifically soft for some reason, such as an atrium or some sort of opening, has a sudden change in stiffness, it means that that floor will see a lot more load as the structure above is rigidly moving. That floor below potentially sees catastrophic because it can't resist those forces. And this is known as soft story mechanism. So for there's a couple of case studies about how different ways people apply different actions to resist these loads. In high seismic areas, there's a number of ways. Where we talked about Taipei 101, where you can see that tune mass dampener on display, where they've made it a feature that helps resist the forces as it counterbalances the load as the building sways backwards and forwards, essentially slowing down the momentum. You can look at Tokyo Skytree, which is using a different method of flexible joints and choose mass dampeners to help dissipate those forces. Another way that you can be effective in those structures is having base isolation. So what does base isolation do? Effectively, like a structure, it allows the structure to move backwards and forwards, but it isolates it from the base. So the structure may move backwards and forwards, but the structure can stay still as the base is allowed to slide backwards and forwards, dissipating the forces. Even on big buildings, you can have tune mass dampness. You can see this quite commonly. It all comes back to those basic ground principles and calculations that we saw above that I've also linked in the below description to give you better access so you can play around with it yourself. And if you did enjoy this content, I've got the reasons behind seismic design here that will bring your seismic designs up to the next level. And if you're interested in supporting the channel, there is two ways that you can do this. You can either become a YouTube or Patreon member. Without the support of my YouTube and Patreon members, this type of content would not be possible. As always, keep learning and I hope to see you in two weeks. Bye.